All right, my friends, it is almost midnight, March 1st, which will soon be March 2nd, actually. And we are here with Matthew Pose. It's been a while since we've done a live stream. How are you doing, Matt? It has been a while. I'm glad to be uh, back with you doing this. I'm doing well. Awesome. Well, tonight we're going to focus on, we're going to focus on, is it too loud? Yeah, I and... mean, oh, you go ahead. Sorry. Oh, okay. This is something I've been wanting to do for a long time now because we always talk about how you want to have great dynamic range when you listen to music and you want to have an audiophile experience. But if you're constantly blasting your ears over time, that audiophile experience may not be as good as you can possibly have or remember how it was decades ago. So I thought it would be an important question to go over safe listening levels and kind of different audio sources that could be real violators of that, not just the home theater, but just being external from your own house sometimes and going into other environments that could be too loud and what are safe guidelines for listening, all that stuff. I think that'd be, uh, you put together some slides I'd like to go over and um, get some people's feedback on here as well, what they think about safe listening. Yeah, and, and before we get into the actual slides, I just wanna mention that uh, a lot of background research went into this presentation and, and the backstory for why that happened was that you had mentioned, uh, you know, concerns over hearing loss and listening too loud. Uh, some other folks that we work with quite a bit, like Peter Tribman, had been talking about how movie theaters had gotten too loud to the point of being obnoxious. I mean, he, he called me repeatedly to say, Matt, you guys got to do something about this. You need to, to do a video. Uh, you know, do these Dolby Atmos theaters are way too loud. And James Larson's been giving me a hard time for as long as I know him for how loud I listen to movies and music. And I always argued, you know, I don't think cinemas are actually dangerously loud. And I don't think I listen too loud. And I don't think I cause hearing damage. And I don't think it causes hearing damage for anyone else. And they all for all of this basically forced me to, to reconsider my own views on this by looking at what the literature really said. And my initial read was, it's not dangerous. And the more I dug, the more I started to understand that there was more to the story than what I had been kind of looking at. And, and I think, you know, a good lesson for me too, and, and for everybody is that depending on how you read the science, you can probably draw any conclusion you want to. And in order to draw the right conclusion, you really have to make sure you've got all the facts. And I really didn't have all the facts when I was going into this. Yeah, that's easily understandable. And you actually, with this slide presentation, I found some things I didn't even know too. So I think what I'll do now is share the screen and then we'll just kind mm -hmm. of proceed from there. And guys, if you have any, if you really want to comment to stand out, don't forget about the super chat feature that's still available. But right now let's get this slide thing going. Do you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So let's do the slideshow. So when is it too loud? Killing me loudly with his song. Um, mm -hmm. so this was just trying uh, to play on a song for those who don't know, but this was, uh, trying to get at the idea that concerts and theaters, and to be honest, I get into more than concerts and theaters have gotten progressively louder over the years for a variety of reasons. And it's killing our hearing, at least it may not be killing us directly, but, uh, there is in fact evidence that some of these things we're exposing ourselves are leading to increases in a number of hearing, uh, sound related hearing disorders. Right. So one of the things that, I mean, I just kept pointing to OSHA and these NIOSH standards um, when I was saying, well, 85 dBs, you know, is what you can be exposed to for eight hours and there's no hearing damage. Well, it turns out that isn't what that standard really said. And so I, I, I basically jokingly said here, we've been misled because I think a lot of us point to 85 decibels as being totally safe. As long as the average volume you're listening to is 85 decibels, then there's just no way you're going to possibly listen long enough in the course of a day to cause hearing damage. Well, it turns out that isn't how that standard was derived. It actually was based, it was, it was specifically for work environments, and it was based on the idea that at the, over the course of your entire work career, at, at the time that you retire, you have just enough hearing left to be able to understand speech. That doesn't actually mean you have no hearing damage. In fact, you could have lost about half of your total hearing in the course of that. And as long as you still have just enough to understand what somebody is saying to you, it's good enough. So in fact, hearing damage can be caused by listening at these levels. But again, and it's, it's, also, more it's also important. It's also important to note that when they do hearing tests, like standard hearing tests, you go to an audiologist, 
they stop at like eight kilohertz. So they're not going all the way to 20 K. So they're not checking how sensitive your, your high frequency hearing is either. Absolutely. Um, and I just want to comment because I keep seeing comments about distortion. Um, distortion certainly is a way of telling us when a system is being overdriven, but in and of itself doesn't tell us when a system is too loud. Um, today, uh, I mean, it, historically, systems couldn't play loud enough to really, uh, I shouldn't say couldn't play loud enough to cause hearing damage, but they, you know, especially like commercial cinemas, for instance, were somewhat limited in just how loud they could play. But um, today with much more powerful amplifiers and higher output speakers, which we'll talk about later, uh, these systems are capable of playing with very low distortion, very clean, at very dangerous and damaging levels. And, uh, and to add to that point, one thing I notice is when you have a system that is very low distortion that plays effortlessly, mm -hmm. when it's playing loudly, 85 dB or higher, it doesn't perceptually sound as loud as a system that is distorted. I've had the same experience. The first time that I uh, had heard the speakers that I own now, uh, I had noticed that I was listening at much louder levels than I had before because they simply didn't distort. And I, I realized I had to start being careful. So, um, but we can go ahead and get more into that in the slides. Yeah. So how loud is too loud? Well, one of the things that I learned in doing my research is that there was a lot of mention of dosage and I needed to try to understand dosage because I didn't get it. You know, I talked about things like 85 dBs for eight hours. And what I found out was actually it's not really about how much you're exposed to in any given moment. Certainly there are volume levels which are so loud that they can cause instantaneous hearing damage, but the likelihood that you'd be exposed to those is actually pretty low. However, what is more likely to cause this noise induced hearing loss is actually your total daily dosage over the course of your life. And so you have to look at it in context. So if you go to a movie and the average movie is 85 dBs and there's peaks of 105 dBs, 115 in the base, but the rest of your day you're sitting in like an anechoic chamber, that's probably never going to cause hearing damage for you. On the other hand, if the course of your day includes, for instance, working in a machine shop, that would be dangerously loud because your total dosage will be too high. Now, yeah. uh, I, I looked into the research on concerts and what I found was that at listening positions or standing positions, you know, depending on the kind of live concert you're at, 100 dBs or more was pretty common, but actually a number of studies had found levels as high as like 130 decibels at a place where a person would be. So I'm not saying everywhere in the audience was that loud, but there was like one of the studies had shown that this area just off the stage where people could you know, readily go over to measured at 130 decibels. And Gene, you know, that's loud enough to do potentially immediate hearing damage. Within minutes, yeah, or less. Right. I, I could tell you personally, I used to go to a lot of uh, rock concerts in my younger years. Like I remember one of the loudest concerts I've ever been to was a Yes concert for any Yes fans out there. They had a talk album back in the, I would say early 90s. And they did this concert in surround sound. So if you brought earphones with you, they would do simulated surround sound in addition to the line array of speakers they had. And I brought some hearing protection, but not good enough hearing protection. And I had to hold my ears the whole time. And I still couldn't hear correctly for about a day and a half to two days. That's how loud it was. It must have been probably close to 120 dB sustained. And I never experienced anything like that in my life. So since then, I would bring in some pretty stout hearing protection uh, anytime I go to concerts. Yeah, I've been to a number of concerts that were definitely too loud and definitely um, it, it's always stuff you don't expect. Like I went to a blues concert and I think, I mean, I don't know, for those who are into the blues, you'll probably say, well, of course, blues can do that. But I, I didn't walk into this thinking this was a, a likely scenario, but it turned out this was like a small, you know, grungy bar. And the blues band was what I would call the... Um, uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan style of rock boot blues and they were loud the bass was turned up loud the whole system was turned up pretty loud we were in a small area I knew the band pretty well so I was right up in the front my ears were ringing for like days afterwards and I'm certain that it caused some probably at least temporary hearing damage yeah so two things I want to say before we exit this slide is the children's toys I think I had you yeah. add that point uh, I remember when my my up oh, I just messed up I remember when my, my oldest daughter was a child and she had an Elmo doll and that when that thing would go off, it was so freaking loud. I couldn't even like concentrate on driving. That's how loud it was. And I took an SPL meter to it back back in the day and it was like 87, 88 dB within a couple of feet of it. 
I mean, that's mm -hmm. just ridiculous to have a child's toy that loud, especially because children put the toys up to their mouths or up to their face. So that's being blasting into their ears for God knows how long. Right. And I had actually looked into that a little bit when you mentioned it. And it turns out that there had been a number of studies that had been published and warnings by groups like uh, the World Health Organization and the CDC that had specifically said that you need to be careful with toys which make noise because kids tend to put it up to their ear. So even if it's safe volume wise at one or two feet, it isn't necessarily safe right up to their ear. So they were just mentioning, you know, a check the device, make sure the toy isn't too loud, you know, at a normal distance and B don't let them do that. Cause that can actually be dangerously loud. The other thing I headphones actually has been what's caused a lot of these problems lately. So headphones have been in the news a lot. Yeah. We, you and I know this cause it's, it's changed the industry dramatically. Headphones are by far the number one way that people listen to music. And uh, in fact, one of the things that's been showing up is that while there have been efforts to try to control this by making it so that the uh, devices, your smartphones or whatever, are incapable of driving the headphones to dangerously loud levels, in they have in the past, and for those of you who are audiophiles who have bought external expensive headphone amplifiers, you can drive headphones easily to clean, undistorted, and very dangerous levels. And there is very strong research that shows that people from my generation and, uh, and younger um, are actually having a much higher rate of hearing damage than prior generations, and it's specifically tied to headphone use. Well, I can tell you my oldest daughter, who still has really good hearing, especially high-frequency hearing, often complains she hears ringing in her ears and mm -hmm. she listens to headphones all day long and i checked her headphones once and i just put them on and these are earbuds by the way and they were too loud even for me i'm like i don't understand how you can listen that long all day long yeah well we can move on to the the next part of this so um i did a little experiment you know as i mentioned uh somebody had contacted me to let me know that these dolby atmos theaters were too loud and I really doubted it. I had actually argued with them that I, I suspected it wouldn't be an issue. Um, so I decided I would give it a test. My family wanted to go and see Frozen 2. I've got a five-year-old daughter. She was four at the time. And we thought it would be good to, to go check that movie out with her. She loves the Frozen series. So I have on my phone a uh, NIOSH app that is uh, calibrated and accurate, and I have a little uh, microphone I can plug into it, which I can also calibrate. I, I can and have calibrated the SPL on to be correct. And it can be used as a, as a dose meter, basically, to, to measure not only the SPLs, but actually give you a whole report on it, the same way you would for a worker in a machine shop. And I did that. So I went to this movie. It was a Dolby Atmos uh, c cinema watched the movie, and set it up to, to do this. And it ended up re uh, reaching about 7.5% of the dosage. So that in and of itself would be safe. It doesn't sound bad. Now, there were instantaneous peaks that were in excess of 130 decibels. I will say, I don't know for sure where the that number came from. There may have been, I, I could have done something like this, you know, hit it with my hand and that caused it to go up. It, I checked um, with a calculator to see if that would have goofed up my dosage and it, it doesn't affect it enough, but that number was very loud. The max peak level that it was reaching was 118 decibels, probably driven by bass, but it doesn't, Yeah. it, it was an A uh, rated scale. So actually, I think that's pretty close to, to an accurate. Yeah, because that filters, A-weighted filters out the base. Exactly. Right. It's filtering out the base. And then the overall average throughout the movie was 89 decibels, which itself is louder than the 85 we often talk about. So the conclusion here, if you looked at this based purely on that exposure, is it's not dangerous, but it is very loud. Except that you've got to take that in context. And the rest of my day was noisy enough that that would have caused me to exceed my daily dose of sound. I'm curious as how you were able to do this while you were watching a movie without your next door neighbor uh, looking and seeing you're playing with your phone. <laughs> well, I so what I did was I put the phone in my uh, pocket with the microphone kind of sticking up a little bit. And um, and I mean, there was nobody there. It was just my, my wife and daughter. So nobody would have seen. But to be honest, it was it wouldn't have even looked that odd to be it was like just my phone in my pocket really gotcha okay all right so how did movies get so loud in other words how did atmos get this loud well one of the things i want to point out is you'll see that there's more than three speakers on the front of this example here and in general in most cinemas including the dolby atmos cinemas there are more than just the front three speakers there's usually a, like an inner set and a wider outer set 
Um, the way that they're calibrated is such that at a midpoint that's about one third, not really a midpoint, it's about one third back in the row of seating, the SPL meter would read 85 decibels from each of the individual speakers. Mm -hmm. So in other words, um, the idea would be that each individual speaker can do that amount, that it can peak at 105 decibels. And then the surrounds are done in banks, basically. So all of the what we'll call like the main level side and rear surrounds together are also supposed to hit 85 decibels. And the total group of Atmos speakers are supposed to hit 85 decibels. So how did it get so loud? Well, you've got five speakers in the front. You've got, you know, probably 30 plus speakers composing the surrounds and Atmos. Um, when you combine all of that together, you can see how you would hit an average of 89 plus decibels. And then like in this picture, you can see there's a lot of subwoofers in the theater that I was at, um, because I happen to have seen pictures of that one when it was constructed. There's subwoofers in the side and the rear and across the front channels on that thing. And they're all 18 inch uh, subwoofers. So that, you know, that system was capable of significant bass. And it was so loud that my daughter actually was freaking out and at one point started getting upset and wanted to leave because the bass was shaking everything so much. And and this is from the child who grew up with me who has a theater that has plenty of bass. Well, so bass yeah, and they, it's important to know, guys, when you're dealing with Atmos in the cinema, it's not like when you're at home when you have two or four speakers in the ceiling. These cinemas, I, I remember the first Atmos cinema I went to to see Gravity they probably had at least 20, 25 speakers in the ceiling. I mean, it was kind of ridiculous, to be honest with you. It was everywhere. Yeah, for sure. So the main point, though, was that over the years, cinemas have added more channels. I also want to mention amplifiers have gotten more powerful than they used to be. And all of this is combining to make cinemas louder than they used to be, to the point that we maybe need to reconsider what we consider to be safe and acceptable levels for commercial cinemas. Gotcha. Okay. So let's move on. All right. So what does the research say? So there's been a lot of concern that movies, concerts, et cetera, are causing hearing damage. And a lot of the research actually draws the opposite conclusion with little risk of damage. There was a two, not, 2019 study that was Pitts et al. found cinemas are not a risk for hearing loss based on surveys and dosage measurements. And this was not the only study. This was just the most recent one I pulled up, but there's been a number of these. And they also note that children may be at greater risk for noise-induced hearing loss than adults, but more research is needed. So basically be cautious. In other words, taking my child to Frozen 2 and choosing the Atmos uh, cinema theater for it maybe was a mistake. Um, they are at all 2018 did a five-year follow-up study on hearing loss and symphony performers. So these are the actual performers up on the stage of a symphony. Uh, for those of you who don't think symphonies get very loud, uh, those have been recorded in excess of 120 decibels in the front row most area before they can get very loud. Um, and they found that both in the initial and follow-up study, there there was basically no unusual levels of noise-induced hearing loss, both over time and, and in that initial. And so exposure levels for them as workers were generally safe. And again, multiple studies have found the same thing. So it's easy to look at this and say, so it must be safe, right? Mm -hmm. and, but there's a but here, which is what we're going to get into. So what about pop concerts? So I found a number of studies looking at this and it turns out pop, rock, that kind of stuff actually probably gets way too loud. Um, and so they, they've done a number of surveys looking at uh, people who attend these concerts um, that, where they both ask them questions about it, uh, including asking questions related to whether they heard ringing in their ears, things like that, which is a sign that there was at least some temporary hearing loss. And they also have done hearing tests. And what they found was 22% had unilateral hearing loss uh, that means it was on one side. Um, they found that the musicians in these bands are like 3.6 times more likely to suffer noise-induced hearing loss. So rock band musicians are way more uh, likely and definitely should be wearing hearing protection. Uh, there was this, uh, probably going to pronounce it wrong, but Halavi Katz et al. 2015 found exposure to amplified music is associated with hearing sensitivity loss in that 3 to 6 kilohertz range, that critical range. And more experience, in other words, having done this for longer, uh, causes worse hearing loss and drummers were the worst off. They got it. They, they tended to have the worst problems. And it's important to note quickly when we talk about hearing loss, it's not just high frequency hearing loss. It's not the bit, just the inability to hear like air and the symbols and stuff like that. It's actually 
causes real world problems. If you're in a room that's loud, that has a loud conversation going on, when you start getting this kind of hearing loss that Matt's talking about, it becomes harder for you to distinguish people talking. You can mm -hmm. get disoriented. Like uh, even myself, like I find myself now when I go into a crowded room, I don't hear people, you know, talking to me as clearly as I did 20 years ago. And it kind of gets annoying. Like I just, it, I get overwhelmed with the sound. And I've talked to a lot of people that are my age and older, and they all have that common thing. And this is definitely because part of this is because you have less sensitivity in those ranges now, just over time being exposed to so many loud sounds. Yeah, research looking at what happens basically when you start to have hearing loss, especially in that three to six kilohertz range, shows that for those who are familiar with the cocktail party effect, it's the ability for you to pay attention to somebody who's talking to you in a noisy environment, and your brain is able to filter out the noises coming from elsewhere. When you have hearing damage in that area, your brain becomes less capable of doing that, and that's problematic in lots of scenarios when you can't basically filter out all those reflections and noises from all around you. Right. So what about us? You know, is listening to music dangerous, you know, or, or watching our movies really loud? Remember, I started this by saying I was defending what I do because I do listen pretty loud. So a meta review of more than 40 studies uh, had found that the, the research is basically inconclusive. It's hard to say. Uh, live concerts are the most serious threat to noise induced hearing loss. 71% of attendees to rock concerts experienced uh, uh, tinnitus following the event, 85% attending the musical events with sound levels between 85 and 110 decibels, which means could be potentially dangerous. Headphone sounds averaged 100 dBs plus for more than 80% of survey respondents. And like I said, research has been showing that specifically in the millennial generation, which is my generation, uh, that, that uh, noise-induced hearing loss is on the rise. And noise-induced hearing loss and tinnitus is very common amongst respondents. So, yeah, listening to music, uh, if you're listening too loud, can, in fact, be dangerous. Yep. What would you say? That was all. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what are some common decibel levels for sounds? Uh, and I'm realizing I can't even read my own slide here, but, but basically... Um, I, I originally was looking at concerts and uh, was finding that those ranged anywhere from like 85 to, let's say, 130 decibels. It actually turns out that car racing is probably one of the most dangerous things that we might expose ourselves to. And I, Gene, you're a car guy. I've always been a car guy, too. I don't know if you've ever been to the races, but I grew up near Watkins Glen. So we used to go to that racetrack all the time. My dad used to get us uh, uh, tickets to get into the pits, which is really loud. And uh, we used to go down there, and I never thought twice about it, but it uh, turns out that those things are capable of producing levels that are often in excess of 130 decibels uh, and probably are very dangerous. Well, I'll tell you, I'll add to that, too. What's even more worse than that is I went to an Air Force show years ago, and seeing one of those big cargo jets take off was mind-blowingly deafening. Like, I just had no idea when they fired their thrusters. I was holding my ears the whole time, ground shaking, super loud, or just going to see like um, back in the day when the space shuttle would go off, if you were close mm -hmm. enough, that thing was pretty loud. But that's, you know, that's short term stuff. It's not like you're being exposed to it for hours on the day, but it's still something you want to guard yourself against. Well, and you got to remember that it's about total sound exposure for the day. So if you go right. to, like I used to go to the races quite a bit, and you're right, I didn't hang out in the pits the whole time. That would just be for minutes at a time. But you still could be in there exposed to that. Those are dangerous enough levels that even a minute of that is way too much. And it eats up a large portion of your daily dosage. Add to that it, that the racetrack... It's like, having, it's like having a big dessert, right? If yeah. you go to a restaurant and eat a big piece of tiramisu, you better not have any empty calories for like the next day. Right, because you've eaten up all your calories. You're done. So you, that's what causes hearing damage over the long term. I almost think we need to have like, you know how you have a calorie meter when, when people are on diets, yeah. you need to have an SPL meter. Well, it's called it. Uh, it's called a dose meter, a dosometer a dose meter. And yeah. um, for anybody that has an iPhone specifically, so I'm, I'm just going to say, I'm sorry, Android guys, but because there's no consistency in the Android hardware, it's not possible to create an accurate app for doing this. Um, you would have to calibrate each individual device uh, to be able to get it right. But on the iPhones, you can do download for free this NIOSH app and it calibrates it to the microphone built into the phone. And I've tested it. It's close, it's close enough to that external microphone that I use that I calibrate because the other mic, the external one will actually fit in my calibrator. So that one I know is right. 
And um, it's it's close enough that if all you want to do is get sound exposure, you can do that. So as long as you have an iPhone, you can basically turn that on, stick the thing in your pocket and see what happens. And that's part of how I did these studies. The other way I did it is for those who use Room EQ Wizard, the SPL meter can also do uh, dosage. Right. So I did another yeah. experiment. Yeah, I did another experiment. I wore uh, a, a dosometer uh, for 24 hours. Now, again, the, the, the dosometer is actually my phone um, to record actual SPL dosage for an entire day. So this was something where I was curious what my normal day is like, given that I like to watch movies quite a bit. Probably I'd say three to five days a week. I'm in my theater watching a movie. I listen to music pretty much every day. But I work from home um, and I and I have my own dedicated office. My theater can be very quiet, so I can sit in there sometimes like, you know, before you and I were talking, I was just sitting in this room. Um, so I watched TV for two hours and the, the volume level was actually about 70 decibels. It appeared uh, it was that was being recorded in the meter and I was taking notes. I listened to music while I was working. That was about 75 decibels or so. Um, I slept for about eight hours and actually it was reading kind of an ambient level of 55 decibels in my in my bedroom. Um, I took my child to a museum that happened to be near a train track. I didn't record the SPL from that, but the train went by. So that probably would have been a higher amount. And it turned out my daily dosage after all of this, including a movie played back at reference levels, was 129%. So I had almost 30% more noise than I was supposed to in a day. And this actually wasn't a very unusual day for me. No, it's a very average day for anybody that's into home theater and listening to music. Yeah. So doing this every day uh, basically is is uh, increasing my risk for noise induced hearing loss by quite a bit and probably suggests I need to start being more careful. Hmm. So um, what if your normal day includes concerts or motorsports? Well, I did some calculations. I, I wasn't about to risk myself and go to a, well, it's also winter here, so I wouldn't have been able to, but <laughs> to go to a, you know, a drag race or a, an F1 car race and, and see what would happen. And so I decided to do calculations based on those SPL values and the expected durations for them, and then how you might spend the rest of your day. And what I found out was there were reasonable scenarios where you might go to like an F1 race or, you know, a Grand Prix or a, uh, a uh, drag race or something like that where you be around really loud cars or you go to a concert and spend let's say three hours at the concert plus again a fairly normal day like take my movie out of the day and and make the rest of my day what you would do if you know before going to these concerts or the races and you could easily end up in a scenario where you were like 400 percent of your daily dosage and i would not be shocked if i've had 200 to 400 percent of my daily dosage when i've gone for instance to the racetracks well, and another thing too, for anybody that's in the medical profession, I have a buddy that's a dentist and uh, he does the drill seven, eight hours a day. And he, <laughs> yeah. told, he, he told me that he has permanent hearing damage in the ear where the drill is. And it's in, the, you know, probably in the two or three kilohertz range, but he went to an audiologist and they found mm -hmm. he's got hearing loss. And this is from a drill that's not that loud. I mean, when you go to the dentist and you hear the drill, it's what, maybe 70 dB, 60 dB, something like that. But it's being exposed to that all day long. And I don't, I don't think at the time he was wearing hearing protection, he might be now, but probably people don't always consider that when they're, especially if you're doing work outside, if you're working with drills or you're working with, you know, chainsaws or hacksaws and stuff like that. Yeah. So I think that brings us really to this point though, what can we do? And it's, uh, you know, we're hearing protection, stupid W H P S will be our new thing. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so they actually make these things called concert ear uh, earplugs. I think you, Gene, maybe the first person to turn me on to this. Um, and I thought that they were expensive. There are high end, like we'll call them audiophile versions of these that do tend to cost a little bit more. But there's yeah. cheap ones. Amazon has them for I think they're like ten or fifteen dollars. And I've got both. To be honest, there isn't a big difference between the two. They both seem to work and they both seem to have a similar effect. Basically, they don't really change the frequency response that you hear. They just attenuate sound. They don't do as much as the best hearing protection would, but that's the point. You like that. So the idea is you go to a movie or a concert, you put these in, everything still sounds good. It just isn't as loud. Yeah. So as opposed to if you go to like Walmart and you get those foam hearing plugs they pr they block out about 32 b 32 or 33 db but you have no high frequency hearing at all when you stick those in right yeah so this is a better option to go with this so um 
I, the other thing I wanted to mention is that James and I have been wearing hearing protection at things like HT events, uh, home theater events that we go to, or very loud music demos um, for a while now, just because we've we've been concerned with how loud some of these events are. Um, we tend to walk out of rooms. Like, can we go to Axbone or, or other audio shows like that? If we walk into a room and it's clearly dangerously loud, we'll just walk out. It's not that important to us. And um, we do that because we want to protect hearing. And one of the things I think anyone who's been around this industry very much will tell you is that um, there's a lot of guys. I mean, Gene, you've seen them that are really into good sound quality, high end cables, uh, high end speakers. They'll they'll debate these issues over how one DAC sounds better than another. And they've got, you know, two hearing aids in. <clears throat> that they've turned off while they're arguing these points. And I'm not trying, there's a lot of people I know whose hearing I trust in some ways who wear hearing aids. So I'm not trying to bag on that. The point is we make such a big deal about our equipment and good sound. And for those of your audience who are young or at least young enough that they don't have any serious hearing protection, if you want to be able to continue to make those arguments in a legitimate way to listen to music, to care about this stuff, you got to protect your hearing now. And, and I think my life lesson going through this is I really need to be better about it. And uh, so I actually, after doing this whole study, I went and purchased um, a higher end pair of uh, headphones that are those noise blocking headphones that are used in like machine shops so that when we go out and do certain kinds of sound testing out in the fields, which sometimes exceed 130 decibels, I'm able to protect myself better. And in general yeah. plan to, to wear those concert uh, earplugs more. And I actually carry them now around with me all the time, just in case. Well, you know, the other thing I'd like to add to that, too, is if you find yourself in an environment where it's incredibly loud and you can't leave the environment, um, like a concert, if you go to a concert and you forget your hearing protection, the best thing I could tell you to do is go to the bathroom, get some toilet paper. Don't stick the dry toilet paper in your ears because it's going to do next to nothing. But if you could wet it, and I know it sounds disgusting, but if you could sounds wet really the toilet gross. paper... It, it is gross, but it works. <laughs> Wet the toilet paper, roll it up, stick it in your ears. You're going to get a decent amount of um, protection, not like you would with a foam tip, but at least you're going to have a fighting chance not to kill your ears that night. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's probably not a bad advice. Uh, so somebody had asked a question earlier about wouldn't going to a non-Atmos theater have had the same base level? And there's a couple of things to to mention here. The first is that there seems to be a belief. I don't want to say research because I had a really hard time confirming this one way or the other. But there's a belief that bass is less dangerous to our hearing than mid and high frequency sound. But I found contradictory research on that, um, including some. So so apparently there's a there's a belief uh, a debate that if your ear there's a, a, a phenomenon that happens where your ear actually produces sound on its own and one argument is that it does that more when you're getting hearing damage. And so they had found in the study that when people were exposed to high levels of low frequencies, it caused the ear to produce these sounds on its own. Um, and that this may have been a sign it was actually causing hearing damage. There was sort of a secondary argument being made that actually those sounds are much higher in frequency and were pretty loud. And so that those the sounds that the ear was making basically in response to the loud bass may itself have been causing hearing damage. But all of this seems uncertain. So I'll just say the bass itself may or may not be damaging to hearing. But the bigger argument here with Atmos is that Atmos is more than just ceiling speakers and a different way of encoding music. The Atmos theaters, like the AMC Atmos theaters, is like a whole package. It's like IMAX. It's a better projector, a better screen, better speakers. There's a particular standard that they're establishing. Everything is calibrated in a, in a certain way. And on top of that, um, what I've been told repeatedly by folks that are kind of in the know on this, Dolby basically locks the volume control and says, don't touch it. This is what it has to be. And I've heard a lot of folks complaining about this. Um, and there's actually been petitions to try to get this change. There's In Europe, they're actually trying to outlaw essentially the volume levels that Dolby Atmos established and, and THX actually had used the same basic standard for sound um, because there's real concern that it's too loud and, and it's causing hearing damage. Right. Well, back to the bass thing real quick. I mean, I guess the reason why people think bass is not as dangerous as the other frequencies is your hearing is less sensitive at those frequencies. Yeah. So, and that's why all these um, OSHA and all these other uh, charts are based on DBA. So they can right. filter out the bass and they do the mids and highs or limited bandwidth, I guess. 
Yeah, I was trying to find if there was some volume level of bass that's too loud because, you know, for most people, probably they're not going to hit that. My guess is most people's home theaters probably can't exceed 105 to 110 decibels in the bass. That would be pretty loud for most. Maybe some people with bigger theaters can do that 115, maybe 120. But uh, James and I, uh, and Gene, you probably fall into this with your own system right now, at least, um, get exposed to systems which are capable of in excess of 130 decibels down as low as 20 hertz and sometimes below. And those are really, really loud levels at such low frequencies. And and I've always wondered, like, is that dangerous? Because, like, that isn't usually what the focus of the research is. But that's pretty loud. I mean, all the, yeah, all the hearing damage studies I've seen have been in mid frequencies, never at low frequencies. So, and low frequencies is not something that helps you sustain conversation. Yeah. So, yep. yeah, the bottom line, guys, is you got to listen safely. I mean, I say this in the meantime, and I have eight foot speakers in my reference room right now. So, but, you know, I do appreciate the fact that you have to watch what you're listening to. And I never knew about this dose meter thing. So this is almost like watching your calories every day. I think maybe we should put an article up on the site so people could download a spreadsheet and just kind of track it themselves. I think that'd be useful for people. So, Matt, thanks for uh, bringing this topic up. I think it was an important topic for us to discuss. Guys, if you like this video, please thumb it up. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Um, we could go in and answer some of these questions later because this has already been pretty long live stream as it is now. Guys, don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. You join our Patreon, you can go in there and ask us what kind of video topics you'd like to be covered. You get access to our content earlier than it goes on YouTube sometimes. And there's just a bunch of other perks you can read about over there. So until next time, my friends, keep listening and listen safely.